Well, let's get our Bibles open to Proverbs chapter number 18. Proverbs chapter number 18. Thank you for that good special, good singing. I sound just like that. You'll have, you'll have to take my word for it. <laughs> Proverbs chapter number 18 and verse number 14 in our Bibles. We've got a good crowd here this morning. Got the whole floor just about filled up and several in the balcony. And it's, it's a blessing to see so many folks here uh, with us for church this morning. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 14, the Bible says this, The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. But a wounded spirit, who can bear? The idea here is that the spirit of a man will sustain or will uphold or will allow them, to, will carry them through a weakness or an infirmity, a downtime, a difficulty. But a wounded spirit, who can bear? And let's uh, pray. And then I'd like to preach on this subject, a wounded spirit. Father, it's good to be in church, and we know that all of us struggle, Lord, from time to time uh, with having our feelings hurt, with having our mind affected by some evil or some bad thing that's come in our way. And we pray that you'd please help us to look at what the Bible says this morning uh, on this subject, and Lord, that you would please encourage and strengthen and uh, give some victory this morning to our church members, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. Well, as with many things, of course, I didn't plan on this being right around the Halloween uh, that so many people are celebrating spooks and spirits. When the Bible talks about a spirit, there's nothing spooky or weird about it. We're not talking about ghosts. We are not talking about uh, uh, premonitions or, or evil, anything this morning. When we're talking about the spirit of man, we're talking about that inner man that is inside of you. That, that, the, that thing that motivates and, and directs that part of your body uh, that does the thinking for you. Uh, people are uh, oftentimes uh, confused about what the spirit is, but the spirit is that part that shapes our perception of the world. It, it shapes our view of the world. When we talk about the indomitable spirit of man, we're talking about somebody who in the inside has an unquenchable, unconquerable drive and desire to go forward, to push further, to accomplish more. And so when we're talking about the spirit of man, we're talking about that inner part that pushes us forward and a wounded spirit is difficult if not impossible to bear right. you can't carry a wounded spirit with you people are drawn or repelled by our spirit people are uh, excited to be around somebody who's got a good spirit I remember in Bible college a uh, young man came to me. We were working together at an auto parts factory or warehouse there. And, and uh, he was very interested in a girl in our, in our college. And this girl was uh, very beautiful. And he came up and he says, what do you think about April Magus? And I said, oh, she's, she's a nice girl. He said, I'm just so attracted to her spirit. And I thought, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I bet, I bet. She's got such a great spirit. But the reality is we are attracted to other people's spirit. When somebody's got a positive outlook and an upbeat attitude and they're, they're uh, interesting to be around, it, it draws us to them. And when they're negative and, and bothersome and, and so easily irritated, it repels us. And that is what we're talking about when the Bible says here that the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. When you've got the inner drive to make it through the rough patches, to get past the down times, to, to walk through the valleys, your, your spirit will sustain your infirmities. And you can make it through sicknesses. You can make it through uh, 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 physical injuries. Injuries, you can make it through family troubles and trauma. You can make it through if you if mentally, if you want to. Right. But if, if mentally you've quit before it's ever happened, if you've given up, if the hope is gone, if your spirit is wounded, who can bear that? 
a wounded spirit. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 23 that we are to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. And if we're going to get a strong, uh, powerful, overcoming spirit, we're going to get it through the word of of God. The more we read it, the more we study it, the more we memorize it, the more we meditate it, the stronger and stronger that our spirit is going to become. Now I cannot put, and you cannot put a a finger on exactly what your spirit is. You cannot look in the mirror and somehow in your retina identify where your spirit is at. Okay, we can't, we can't look into the mirror and, and tell us exactly where our spirit is. But I, I use this illustration all the time, uh, especially with our young people. If, if I have a mirror and I'm showing you a mirror, what do you see? Who says, I see myself? You don't see yourself. You see a reflection right. of yourself. You're not actually in the mirror. It's a reflection of who you are. And while you can't necessarily identify your attitude, you can see a reflection, or excuse me, you can't identify your spirit. You can see a reflection of your spirit in your attitude. When you show an an upbeat, chipper attitude, an exciting attitude, you've got a, a, we can do this attitude, a, a, we are going to come out on top attitude. That's a reflection of your spirit. And when you've got the, the mully grubs, that's also a reflection of your spirit. So your spirit is seen. It's, I'm not telling you your attitude is your spirit, but your attitude shows your spirit. So how does a spirit get wounded? Let's look at that this morning. Our first, our first thought this morning. How does your spirit get wounded? Well, uh, in a physical sense, we're all used to wounds. And in a physical sense, we're used to cuts and bumps and bruises and maybe a broken bone. Uh, several of us have had a broken bone at some point in our life, been involved in a car accident or, or, or seen something happen uh, to another person where there, were blood, where there was blood involved. And we're all used to what a physical wound is. I remember as a, a young, young kid, I was probably six or seven. I, we, my brothers and I had this wonderful idea that we would build a booby trap in the tree in our front yard. And what we were going to do is take a brick, tie a rope around it, hoist it up into the tree, and then make a little rope circle so that if somebody stepped in that uh, rope and walked it off, the brick would fall out and conk them right in the head. (laughs) You know, and to a six-year-old boy, this is seven, I don't remember how old I was, but this was a great idea. And I was uh, standing underneath the tree and my brother had climbed way up there and he's pulling on the rope. And somehow our little six and seven year old hands didn't tie the rope tight enough. And that brick came right down out of the tree and landed right there. And the, the big mental picture that I have in my mind from that moment was standing in the bathroom and looking in the mirror and just the whole side of my face was covered in blood and several stitches and trip to the ER. And how do wounds happen? Well, the reality is most of the time accidentally and most of the time because somebody did something stupid. (laughs) Well, you get in a car accident. It's because somebody did something that they, it was just foolishness. But very seldom are a, a, a time that a wound happens is done on purpose. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. There are people who will uh, come, come steal your, your money at gunpoint or, or with a knife and intend to harm you. But the majority of times that we get wounded, it's not done on purpose. It's a scraped knee, so to speak, or it's a cut elbow or it's some, uh, some accident that happened where there's you know, broken glass, like for, an, for example, in a, a car accident or something where we're wounded and it wasn't on purpose. I, I know that a lot of times we get wounded by other people spiritually. And in our mind, they did it on purpose. But if somehow you could figure out what really happened, they hadn't a clue. 
that they even did that or said that or meant that, that, that you were even bothered about it. And we sometimes get cut and wounded deep, deep in our spirit by people that say things or do things or don't do things. And, and we allow those wounds to, to take, a, take a place in our uh, spirit. A healthy spirit is going to be one that takes on challenges, but a, a, a wounded spirit is going to be one that's easily defeated. A healthy spirit has big plans and dreams and goals, uh, but a wounded spirit says shelter in place. A healthy spirit is one that has this a sense of humor and a sense of joy and a sense of belonging. But a, a wounded spirit has a sense of discouragement and a sense of being ostracized. A healthy spirit has gratitude and contentment, but a wounded spirit has a dismal outlook. A healthy spirit is a strong will to live, but a wounded spirit will question why we are even living. A healthy spirit will take comments in stride, but a wounded spirit will dwell on those comments and be easily offended. So how does your spirit handle it when somebody accidentally says something that hurts you or, 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 or causes you to repeat it in your mind? And isn't that the way we do it where we hear one person say one thing in about a 15 second span and then for the next several days, weeks or months, we tell it to ourselves hundreds of times again. And it takes up hours and hours and hours of memory playback when the whole event was only like 15 seconds long in the beginning. What happens is those wounds that are accidental and un, uh, uh, unintended become festering, infected, pus filled spiritual sores. But sometimes your spirit also gets wounded on purpose. Sometimes there's an abuse situation. Uh, obviously, we think about our, our veterans here in just a couple of weeks. We'll have a veteran Sunday. And there are many, many of our veterans who, who suffer from combat PTSD and they're wounded spiritually. Now, they might physically be fine, but mentally, uh, spiritually, they're wounded from PTSD. And that's not something that they walked into on purpose. That's, uh, I mean, that's not something that happened accidentally. That happened on purpose. They walked into a, a combat zone and there were people trying to kill them. And so they're suffering from, uh, uh, from spiritual wounds that are real. Perhaps there is a physical abuse or inside of the home, there's some willful hatred or intentional aggravation uh, against whether it's the children or, or the parents uh, against each other. Sometimes spouses will push each other's buttons purposefully trying to dig up old wounds and, and open up uh, old wounds that should have been closed up a long time ago. The reality is most of the time it's accidental, but some of the time it is purposeful, but all of the time it needs treatment. You cannot possibly walk around on a broken leg. You cannot walk around with an open cut. You cannot walk around your daily life with, with uh, some infection in your eye. You cannot walk around every day with an open wound. But spiritually, you can. And nobody's going to know. And a lot of times we think that we've got it covered up really well. But the Bible says a wounded spirit who can bear so how does it happen? Well, a lot of times it happens accidentally. Some of the time it happens on purpose. All of the time it needs to be treated. And here's the thought this morning that I really want to drill down on. The Bible says the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear. So who is capable of picking up this wounded spirit and carrying it along with them? Who is capable of handling a wounded spirit properly? 
Well, the reality is not you. You are not capable of handling the wounded spirit if you have one. And listen, it happens just like cuts and bruises. Sometimes you've got one and then you heal it up. And then a few months later, there's another uh, wound. And then that one gets healed up. You hear great preaching or revival services or God does something in your heart at a, at a team camp or whatever it is. And you get some victory back and you get some spiritual health back and you begin to uh, overcome that wound. And then another time down the road, it happens again. A physical wound is so much like a spiritual wound. And when you allow a spiritual wound to go untreated, you're allowing your spirit, your outlook, your drive, your determination, your focus, your motivation, all of that is affected. Your relationships are affected. Your earning potential is affected. Your, your outlook becomes negative. And you have basically... An inner, an inner laceration that's festering. And if you don't treat that, it will not treat itself. Yes, sir. You right. cannot bear a wounded spirit. Let me tell you who else, who else cannot bear a wounded spirit. Your spouse. If you're married, your spouse cannot bear your wounded spirit. And they'll tell you that. <laughs> Your spouse cannot handle the constant griping and complaining, the grouchiness, the anger, the easy irritation, the, the irritability. Those are not the, com, the, uh, the, excuse me, those are not the qualities that you demonstrated while you were dating. Ask, ask a girl out to a, to a date. Hey, would you, you know, would you go out on a date with me? You're looking lousy today. <laughs> hey, would you, would you go to dinner with me? I hate to pay for all this food you're going to eat. <laughs> That's not what wins the heart. But when our spirit is, is wounded, when our outlook changes, when we begin focusing on the negative, we come home and bring that negativity to our spouse. We, we, we come home and bring that to our family budget. We come home and bring that to our decision making about the children. And the reality is your spouse can't handle it. You can't handle it. And third of all, your children can't handle it. When you snap, because Junior forgot to take the trash out, and and uh, <laughs> I remember as a as a kid, my my parents did not have the healthiest of marriages, and we were sitting at the dinner table one one uh, evening, and my dad said something about um, about buying something, and my wife. Uh, my mom, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> I promise you. Uh, listen, listen. <laughs> Anyhow, my mom said something about my mom said something about the finances, and then she picked up a bowl of spaghetti and hurled it. I mean, threw it at my dad. And I was I don't know how old I was. I nine or ten. My, my older brother, Tug, had gone to his friend's house. You say, who names their kid Tug? I don't know. <laughs> but my older brother, Tug, had gone to his friend's house. And when, when he came home, he saw a bunch of what he thought was blood on the refrigerator that had, had draped down. He went outside running and screaming and had the neighbors call the cops. And um, <laughs> it was, it was a, a memorable fight. But I say that to say somebody hurt, somebody got their feelings hurt, right. somebody had their spirit wounded and then turned a simple comment about spending money into throwing spaghetti. There's no need for that. That's right. There's never going to be a place for that. And there's no, there's never a place for holes in the drywall in a house. There's never a place 
or a time when it's okay to, to uh, display your wounded spirit in such a way that everyone, mom, the kids, everybody in the house has to hear or think or know about your wounded spirit. Your kids can't handle it uh, when you snap over little things. Your children can't handle it uh, when you don't want to be around them because you're so self-absorbed. It creates distance. If you've ever had the thought, why don't my kids want to talk to me? That's not your kid's fault. That's probably somehow a wounded spirit that needs treated where you're, you're, you're offloading a bunch of, uh, a bunch of um, infection and, and filth onto your children and then you're surprised that they don't want to hang out with you. Unfortunately, your children cannot handle a wounded spirit. They take it personally. And in the, the earliest years of their life, when their whole spirit is being trained, when their attitude is being developed and you yell and scream and, and shout and fuss and everything and everybody, that teaches them to do the same thing. So you can't handle it. Your spouse can't handle it. Your children can't handle it. But God can handle it. Amen. The Bible says a wounded spirit, who can bear? Well, God right. can bear it. God can take your wounded spirit and heal it up. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse number 22 that there is a balm in Gilead. That the Lord Jesus Christ is that ointment, that salve that will cover over that, uh, that wound inside of your soul, inside of your spirit, excuse me, that, will, uh, that can be treated through the balm of Gilead. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse number 22 says that God can give you a merry heart that will do good like a medicine. Isaiah 61, verse number one, the Bible speaks about the Lord Jesus Christ some 700 years before he was born and says that this Messiah, this uh, Lamb of God would come to bind up the brokenhearted and to mollify with ointment. And Jesus in, in uh, Luke chapter four begin to uh, open the scriptures in that temple, or excuse me, in that synagogue there in Nazareth. And he rolled that scroll of Isaiah open. And he said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me for he hath anointed me to preach good tidings. And he talked about binding up the brokenhearted and setting the captive free. And when he got done, he rolled that scroll up and he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. I'm here to tell you that if you've ever met the Lord Jesus Christ on the pages of scripture, you know that he can handle a wounded spirit. You know that he's more than capable of binding up those wounds that like it says in Luke chapter five and verse number 31, that he is the physician that a sinner can run to, that he is the great physician, the minister that can take care of our physical and our spiritual needs. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 12 says to strengthen the feeble knees and lift up the hands that have fallen. Well, who can do that? Well, according to Isaiah, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. When you get your spirit, your inner man, alone with the great physician, he can heal your wounds. He's been to spiritual med school and he aced every single exam. The Lord Jesus Christ holds all 10 spots on the top 10 list of physicians. The Lord Jesus Christ has done all the research and he's written all the entries into all the spiritual medical journals and they're all available for you to read. The Lord Jesus Christ is everything from an EMT all the way up to a specialist. It doesn't matter what your need is. If all you've got is a scraped knee, he knows exactly how to treat it. If what you've got is brain cancer, he knows exactly how to treat it. And the only one that can cure all of those is all of those spiritual wounds is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what the best thing about it is? There are no insurance companies involved. 
You don't have to make a copay before you read your Bible. There are no approvals that are necessary before the Lord can do surgery on you. There's no out-of-pocket expenses when you meet with the Lord Jesus Christ. Who can bear it? Only the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the last thing I want to look at is what's the cure for a wounded spirit? Well, look, at, look in your Bibles at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 26. The first thing you need to do when you have a wound is wash it out. Very seldom will uh, you find an EMT on the side of the road and somebody's been skidding across the asphalt and they've got all kinds of dirt and junk in their wounds and the EMT says, all right, let's put a bandage on it. They wash it out. That wound needs to be cleaned out. There's dirt, there's, there's uh, bacteria, there's mess in there that has to get pulled out. Well, how do you treat a wounded spirit? You've got to wash it out. And the Bible says in verse number 26 that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. You've got to pour the word of God over your spirit that's wounded. You have got to take cool running water and wash your wounded spirit. Now, if you are, if you are stubborn enough, foolish enough, proud enough, to say, well, I don't have any wounded spirit. I'm fine. You can't wash a wounded spirit if you won't even admit that it's there. Right, that's right. I don't have it in my notes, but really that should have been point number one. You should admit that you're wounded and then start to wash it out. Right. Because when you can get to the place where you finally say, okay, it's me. I'm the problem. I am the one who is hurt. I need to do something about this. Then you take the word of God and you begin pouring that water into it. Then we also need ointment uh, on our wounds. That's meditating on the verses in the Bible. When you meditate on verses about forgiveness, it does something to your spirit. You think about that, you know, Jesus told the disciples this story about a man who had borrowed uh, some enormous amount, several years wages. And then he went to the debtor and he couldn't pay it. And the debtor said, he, frankly, he forgave him. He just forgave him. Instead of paying me back all those hundreds of thousands of dollars, you're free. And that person shouted glory, got excited. Yes, I'm free of this debt. And he went out and he found somebody that owed him just a few dollars. And he grabbed him by the clothing and he threw him in the debtor's prison. And he required that man to pay the debt after this man had just been forgiven of all those hundreds of thousands of dollars. And we do that so much. Where we, we've been forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ for millions of dollars worth of sins. If you could total up how much hurt you've put on the Lord by your blatant disobedience, it's, un, it's, it's so huge. I mean, it's the size of the national debt. And he forgives us of all of that. And then we go to our boss or our coworker or our spouse or somebody who, you know, said some mean joke and was just trying to be funny and we grab them by the clothes it, up here and we say, you're going to get what you deserve. I am not putting up with this. I cannot believe you. And we throw them in the debtor's prison after we've been forgiven of so much. Listen, when you begin to think about stuff like that, about what Jesus said, it changes your opinion about how silly it is to hold on to those grudges. Yes, sir. That's ointment in the wound. That's a, that's a salve being put on uh, the wound. My grandmother used iodine on every single cut. <laughs> get, a, get, a little kind of, get a little cut and that eyedropper of iodine would come out and our skin would be yellow for like three days. It was awesome. That's what meditating on the scriptures does. 
for you. It kills that bacteria. It kills that infection. It begins to heal up that wound. Wash with the water of the word and read and read and read and get familiar with it and, and spend time reading, but then spend time studying too. That's the ointment. Meditate. Uh, spend time memorizing uh, the word of God. Isaiah chapter one and verse number six. I want to quickly look there. The book of Isaiah chapter one and verse number six talks about some spiritual wounds. In the Bible here, of course, Isaiah was prophesying at a time when the northern ten tribes uh, were about to be taken captive by the Assyrians. And then shortly following that, the, the southern two tribes were going to be taken captive by the Babylonians. And Isaiah opens up where he's preaching to Judah, to those two southern tribes. And he's talking about how just disgusting their lifestyle is, how sinful and how awful their, their lifestyle is in their nation. Verse number uh, four says, all sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers. Verse number five, God says, why should ye be stricken anymore? What that means is why should you be, be hit or beaten anymore. And here's the picture. God has, has punished them and chastised them and whipped them and beat them and given them every kind of punishment that they could handle. And they like sneeringly looked over their shoulder and says, is that all you got? Why should you be beaten anymore? Why should you be stricken anymore? So many times God begins to deal with us and deal with us and deal with us. And it's like we turn around to the Lord and say, is that all you've got? That's where the nation of Israel was in Isaiah chapter one and verse number six, the Bible says from the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefy putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. We need to acknowledge the fact that our country is right where they were. And the reason why our country is right where they were is because the church is right where they were. And the reason why the church is right where they were is because the people in the church are right where they were. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We've got to get the ointment of the word of God meditating on those verses to heal up our wounded spirits. And then there needs to be a bandage over that wound, uh, a suture, some type of tightening up, some type of uh, a binding together to hold that wound closed or to keep that uh, limb uh, immobile. We've got to have some boundaries in our life. We've got to have some tightening up. We've got to have some getting rid of some things in our life that cause us damage. We've got to bind up our wounds. Sometimes that means if, the, if, for example, in a situation where you are being purposefully wounded and there's another party that's abusing you, sometimes that, that, that bandage is just getting away from that person. Sometimes we need to set boundaries about how much time and how much, uh, how much energy is going to be invested into somebody. But we need some binding up. We need some bandages around our spiritual wounds. We need some accountability. We need some accountability in our life. Oftentimes, and I, I, I can't stress this enough. Oftentimes, the spiritual wounds we have are self-inflicted. And we sit down in front of whatever idol that the world has and we give our brain completely to it. Social media, TV, whatever you want to call it, that's an idol that we wound ourself looking at what the world's doing, what the world has, what the world wants. And spiritually we get weaker and weaker and weaker. And it's, it might not be like a stab wound, it's more like a cancer. And we need some accountability in our life to bind up that wound. And then last of all, we need some time to heal our wounds. 
Somebody's hurt you, don't expect to be over it tomorrow. Don't expect to just get, oh, you know what? I have had the last six months of my life just in utter misery. I hadn't figured out why I'm here or what we're doing. And, and man, I've got just no outlook. I've got no desire to do anything. But tomorrow's going to be brand new. It might not happen like that. And if you pick up the Bible one time and read it one time and think God's going to heal you in one instance, that's not how medicine works. You don't go to the doctor and get a prescription and he says, take one pill and then leave the rest in the bottle. It takes time. But you deciding I'm wounded and I don't want to be anymore is critical. And when you get alone with Jesus Christ, the one who heals all wounds, he will bind up the brokenhearted. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ and you've never met the Lord Jesus Christ, and you don't realize what it means to have the balm of Gilead or to have a relationship with the great physician. You can know him today. In fact, we're going to have a time where we open up the altar and folks that want to pray, maybe there's somebody here who's holding on to bitterness or holding on to a grudge or holding on to some wound, and that wound is festered and festered, and they need to just admit that it's time to get healed. There's going to be several folks that come here in just a moment. But as we stand to our feet, and I'll ask you to do that at this time, I want you to do some thinking. If you're here and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, today could be the greatest day of your life where you come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The altars are beginning to fill up, but I'll ask, I'm not trying to embarrass you, but if you're here and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, but you would like to, you would like to look at what the Bible says about Jesus. You would like somebody to take the Bible and show you what the Bible says about the Lord Jesus Christ, about this great physician. If you're here and you'd like somebody to show you from the scriptures how you can know for sure that Jesus is your savior, would you raise your hand? I'm not trying to embarrass you, but if you'll put your hand up, there are people all over around the outside of the auditorium that have a Bible and are trained in the scriptures that can show you the Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody have a hand up anywhere? Amen. As the piano plays, if you've got business to do with the Lord, now's your opportunity. If the Lord took time to speak to you, I hope that you'll take time to speak back to him.